Jaguar Cars Incorporated presents Suspension and Drivetrain, Part 1. For almost 20 years, the performance of the Jaguar suspension system has been the standard to which all other high-performance luxury cars are compared. There are probably as many varieties of suspension systems as there are makes of cars. However, none have been able to match Jaguar's blend of tenacious road holding, precise handling, and luxurious ride. To achieve this high level of performance requires a suspension that can make the delicate compromises necessary to control an incredible number of opposing factors. This first part of the suspension and drivetrain series will familiarize you with the factors which must be considered when designing a suspension system, a detailed look at Jaguar suspension, and important service information necessary to ensure that suspension work is carried out successfully. Automobile suspension systems have evolved over the years as our knowledge of the factors acting on road vehicles has increased. Let's take a look at some of the factors which must be considered. The entire mass of the vehicle is supported by the road surface, which is contacted only by the suspended wheels. This presents the first major difficulty in suspension design. In effect, we have two levels of action. At the upper level, a smooth, steady, and quiet environment is desired, while at the lower level, a secure contact with the ever-changing road surface is necessary for optimum control. Although the vehicle's only means of control is through the tire contact area with the road surface, the motions about all three axes, roll, pitch, and yaw, must be dealt with. The driver directs the vehicle's yaw motions. However, roll and pitch motions are controlled only by the suspension system. Besides these, the gyroscopic effects of acceleration, braking, and rotating mass must be countered. Additionally, internal and external forces cause fore and aft, side to side, and up and down motions, which also must be countered. The control of these motions and forces must be accomplished in conjunction with providing directional control, stability, and a smooth, quiet ride. The familiar suspension angles, caster, camber, steering access inclination, and toe setting are designed to provide directional control and stability. Good road holding and handling can be accomplished by combining light weight and a taut suspension. Ride, of course, will be sacrificed with this arrangement. On the other hand, a smooth ride can be produced by combining soft springing with a heavy vehicle. This will provide lackluster road holding and handling at best. The combination of good road holding, handling, and ride then becomes a difficult goal to achieve. Early systems, for the most part, used solid beam-type axles, which were simple, strong, and durable. However, they were essentially the same system used on ox carts, with springs and shock dampers added. The beam has two main drawbacks. The first is poor control. When a single wheel passes over a bump, it tilts from the vertical and also tilts the wheel on the opposite side. Tilted wheels do not fully contact the road surface, and changes in the wheel position relative to the body produce a tendency for the vehicle to change its direction of travel. The other main drawback is considerable unsprung weight. The mass of the moving axle assembly greatly influences the vehicle's stability. Unsprung weight is everything in the lower level of action or simply everything below the springs. The suspension components, axles, brakes, wheels, and tires. The less these components weigh, the less momentum they will have in motion. 
making control of their movement easier. Later, the benefits of independent suspension were recognized. These systems allow independent movement of each wheel with much less effect on the opposite wheel. Tire contact was improved and distortion of the direction of travel was reduced. Just as important was a large reduction in unsprung weight. Front and rear independent systems have evolved separately due to the different requirements of drive axles and steering axles. Today, we see two types of front suspension in popular use, the twin control arm and the strut types. The strut type is inexpensive to produce, but it has the disadvantage of placing high loads on the shock absorbers and produces substantial track and camber changes under deflection. The twin control arm system used in Jaguars is made up of A arms of different lengths. The shock absorbers do not carry suspension loads and only minor changes in track and camber are produced under deflection. Rear suspensions are more varied. Many vehicles continue to use beam axles. Additionally, various forms of trailing arm systems. Strut systems. And link systems are used. You'll notice that the link system used in Jaguars most closely resembles the twin control arm front system. Of the independent systems, it too produces the least amount of suspension angle change under deflection. The basic design of the Jaguar system allows the engineers to achieve a high level of suspension performance. In addition to this, the methods employed for construction, mounting, isolation, and the transmission of loads provide refinement and durability to the system. The entire front suspension is built up on a subframe assembly. This attaches to the chassis through four mounting bushings. Spring turrets are incorporated into the subframe to retain the upper ends of the road springs. With these arrangements, all suspension loads transmitted to the chassis travel through the bushings, which have an isolating effect. Rugged, forged steel upper and lower A arms provide durability and resist distortion under high loads. The upper is formed by two separate arms which pivot on a bushed fulcrum shaft mounted to the subframe and form an A when attached to the upper ball joint. The lower one-piece A arm pivots on a bushed shaft running through the subframe and connects to the lower ball joint. An axle carrier connects between the upper and lower A arms through the ball joints. The upper ball joint is non-adjustable while the lower ball joint can be adjusted for fit. A stub axle mates to the carrier in a tapered bore and supports the wheel hub through taper roller bearings. Separate shock absorbers connect between the lower A arm and the inner fenders. The anti-roll bar attaches to the chassis through bushings and connects to the lower A arm via links and bushings. The rear suspension is also built up on a subframe assembly and is isolated by four V bushings. As we said, the rear link system is geometrically similar to the front double A arm system. The drive shaft with two universal joints acts as the upper A arm. And the lower link, or wishbone, acts as the lower A arm. Pivoting on needle roller bearings at the inside cross member and on taper roller bearings at the hub carrier on the outside 
the lower link is strengthened to withstand drive and braking loads. Radius rods transmit the drive and braking loads to the chassis through bushings at both ends. The aluminum alloy hub carrier houses the rear hub, which is splined to the drive shaft. Once more, taper roller bearings support the hub. Double coil shock units connected to the lower link and the subframe combine spring action and dampening. To further reduce unsprung weight, the disc brake assemblies are mounted inboard where their mass will not be in motion during suspension deflection. As you can see, the construction of Jaguar suspension takes no shortcuts to achieving its goal of delivering superior performance. Servicing this system requires the knowledge of certain information which will ensure that the high level of performance is maintained. Wheel alignment related adjustments and preparatory checks are detailed in the Performance Masters program, Jaguar Alignment Procedures. Here, we'll concentrate on overhaul and R&R &R information for the front suspension. Components pivoting through rubberized bushings must be torqued in the mid-laden condition. This will allow free movement in both directions of travel and prevent undue stress on the bushings. This includes both the upper and lower A-arms and the shock absorbers of the front suspension. Position the BLT5024 mid-laden tube between the rear bump stop and the subframe. The upper and lower A-arm pivots are torqued after assembly to the other suspension components. The shock absorber lower attach point is torqued after the upper portion is released and guided into the mounting hole. Subframe bushings can be removed and replaced without major disassembly of components. This is accomplished by replacing only the two front or two rear bushings at one time. Removal and replacement of the lower A-arm pivot shaft requires the lowering of the rear of the subframe. Note the position of the special washers when the shaft is removed. Caution! When lowering the subframe for service, be aware that components connected to or mounted on the subframe will require disassembly to prevent stressing. Do not stress the brake hoses. As the subframe mounts to the front bushing with a clamping arrangement, it is necessary to centralize the subframe on the front bushings before torquing the front and rear mounting hardware. A complete wheel alignment service must be performed after the position of the subframe has been altered. The front road springs must be replaced as a set. This requires the use of tool JD6F to compress the spring and allow removal. After removal, discard the springs and packings. Do not reuse the packings with new springs. Replacement springs are supplied with new packings which must be installed as specified. Springs with a yellow code require two top and two bottom packings. Purple coated springs require one top and two bottom packings and white coated springs require one top and one bottom packing. The spring color code refers to the small paint code on one of the spring coils, not the overall paint marks on the spring. When installing the springs, fit the two guide pins included with JD6F to the inner bolt threads of the lower control arm. This will align the spring pan with the remaining bolt holes. 
The lower ball joints are built-up assemblies with provision for fit and minor wear adjustment. Free play of the lower ball joint is checked with a dial indicator. Clamp the indicator to the lower A arm and position the contact pin on the ball joint cup. With the hub in the straight ahead position, move the hub up and down to determine the free play which should be four to six thousandths. This specification is with a dry ball joint. Make allowances for grease. Correct excessive free play by removing or exchanging shims between the lower ball cup and the hub carrier. Shims are available in three thicknesses, two, four, and ten thousandths. Caution, the spring must be compressed to perform this operation. After correcting the free play in the straight ahead position, turn the hub full left and full right to check for a bind in the ball joint action. Binding indicates an excessively worn ball joint. Replace the ball and cups using a new shim pack. Excessive wear cannot be corrected by adjustment. Shock absorber lower hardware is installed differently on the XJ6 and S. The XJ6 front shocks should have the lower bolt heads facing rearward while the XJS lower bolt heads face forward. Sway bar bushings should be installed with the split toward the rear. The front brake calipers are shimmed to align them with the brake rotors. The shims are always positioned at the lower mounting and should be reinstalled in their original position after removal. The two brake caliper mounting bolts are locked using safety wire. Be sure the wire is installed so that the bolts cannot turn counterclockwise. Lubrication of the front suspension is required only at the ball joints and the hubs. The service information shown here is in the form of service notes. Detailed procedures and techniques are found in the appropriate service manual. Rear suspension and drivetrain service information will be presented in part two of this series. This completes suspension and drivetrain, part one, another performance master's service training program.